Hello, uh, I'm Dominic Vignola. I'm a painting instructor. I teach uh, oil painting without drawing, also known as tonal impressionism. And we're here today with Jill Cross, who's uh, never painted before, never picked a brush. And uh, we're gonna have her do a painting from start to finish in one day using this method of uh, not drawing on the canvas. And I wanna show first uh, a chart I came up with years ago to help people mix colors. It's based on the Munzel color chart where there's 10 values from black being one, white being 10. What we've done is simplified. We've eliminated every other one and we're using the odd numbers, nine, seven, five, three, one, to get the, uh, the different values in the painting. And we're gonna start out today doing a, what I call rub up. Some people call it a wipe out uh, to cover the canvas with this dark brownish color, which is Romber for you painters out there. And we're gonna take a rag then. Viva Tell is the one that works the best because it's soft, it kind of works like cloth and she's gonna wipe out the lights to create the beginnings of the image. It basically takes the place of doing a line drawing. You get the shapes down by contrast of light and dark rather than by making outlines because whether you realize it or not, lines don't exist in nature. So we try to not deal with them in painting. So we'll have Jill uh, pick up a big brush. Um, I've got some romber here. We'll put a little more out just so we don't have to replace it. Add a little oil to it so it kind of flows a little bit better because most canvases are fairly rough when you're working on cloth so you want it to kind of glide and if it feels like it's kind of stiff later Joe, you just kind of dip in like this and get it so it's almost like the the consistency one student said one time it looks like vaseline that's what you want it to be like so just take this and just kind of scrub all over you're gonna you don't want to put the paint on too heavily because in this case, a lot of the canvas is dark, but in most cases, you'll be removing a lot of it, so you just don't want to create a lot of extra work for yourself. Like that? Yeah, you can even scrub it like this, even, even go like this. Because oh. you want to get it to be to look like it's a bit lighter than the... This is a value one. It's, it's pretty close to being black, so that's yeah, a good amount of paint. And just keep dipping when you feel like it's... Uh, because the thinner the coat of paint, the lighter it looks. The heavier the paint, the darker it looks. And that color is fairly opaque, so it, it should cover pretty well. well I'll, I'll replenish it for you as you, you're going along here. So as I, if I keep going, it'll get lighter, right? Yeah, right. And this is just to get it in all the creases? All the yeah, I mean, you don't have to cover it totally like you're painting a wall, but uh, we want to get it to where it's uh, fairly dark, you know, and fairly evenly colored, so that when you go to put the lights in, you'll get enough contrast between where you rub out. And obviously the harder you rub, the lighter it gets, the softer you rub. The less you bear down on it, the darker it stays. What do I want it? Pardon me? How do I want it, dark or? Yeah, yeah. that's a good amount. See, that, that's just the right amount of paint to, uh, that's a good to get a good dip. <laughs> yeah, and if that feels a little stiff, just dip, a, dip the tip of the brush into the uh, oil. I feel You're actually doing this better than a lot of experienced people. I feel the burn <laughs> in my arm. <laughs> Good exercise. Try not to get too much on the, on the photo. Oh. <laughs> That's right. We'll wipe it off. Don't be good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now, once they say about oil paint, it's very forgiving. It stays wet long enough where you can take off a mistake or wipe things off. Some of the colors, the darker colors, are very staining, so you have to watch. That's why I tell people don't wear any clothing that you really value because it's going to get messed up at some point. I need more. Move this so you don't get it on you. I need more paint. Yeah. Okay. Am I using more than usual? No, no. Oh. This is probably the, the color we use more than any besides the grays, the black and whites there. What kind of oil is that? It's linseed oil, which is actually something people take every morning. It's just called flaxseed oil when you buy oh. in the, uh, the uh, health food stores. It's made from the seed to crush they, they crush the seed of the flax plant it's good for you yeah okay, okay that's good. Is that good yeah so what you can do again this is not drawing but you could take something like this which is a palette knife to mix paint with or you could even take something like this which is a scraper they make to remove mistakes when the paint's dry and you could actually just kind of look at this study for a moment and determine like where you think the top of this light shape you know, stops, kind of gauge it. Now, obviously this picture is slightly smaller than the canvas. So if you try and make this about the same size, you'll end up with a little extra room on the top and bottom, which is fine. But if 
you're basically painting an actual size or as some people call it side size. So if you make a little mark for here, for there, for there, and maybe for over here, that'll give you the height and the width so that you'll make the thing too big because the natural tendency is to make things too big usually if you're not being careful, so. Okay, so just kind of look at that for a second and just, you know, if you make a mistake, we just paint it over. We get rid of it. You know. So what am I doing? You're going to just make a little scratch mark to indicate where that is, where that is, that right there. This way you won't have a tendency to go too big to make that shape. You mean big. this? Like, yeah, just scratch it left to right. And then go. where? Like down here, you know, more or less where the, uh, but see, make it a little bit smaller so that you've got a little, little extra room because otherwise your, your pot will end up being bigger than that in reality. You can leave a little more room on the top and bottom. So you're saying go down more? Yeah, there you go. Right. And go up a little more there. There you go. Because see, it's better, I usually tell everybody in class, it's better if you make things about seven eighths the size you think of it, because by the end of the painting, it'll end up expanding to about the same, the actual size it should be. Okay. Yeah, and then just make a little mark for here, maybe, and maybe where you think the, maybe that edge there, that one over there. This way you've got some parameters to stay within, you know. In the outside of that? Yeah, the outside of there. Here you go. Yeah? Yeah. No? <laughs> so you don't take a clean rag here. This is a clean dry rag because a dry rag will take off less paint than a wet rag. As we get it further into it, you want to pull out areas where it's almost white. Then we'll dip the rag in a paint thinner. That'll take it off cleanly. But you start with the... We kind of fold it up like this so that most people would tend to go like this and don't want to draw with it. You don't want to do that. So you're going to kind of go like this. I'll just show you on here. You just kind of rub left to right. Just to get something, as soon as you make a light shape, you know, you rub off a little paint, you'll create a shape, okay? But don't worry, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, as one of my mentors said, the painting starts out wrong and ends up right when you do it this way because we're not trying to establish any kind of, you know, preliminary drawing with outlines. So the shapes come about by contrast to light and dark. There you go. I try to, if you squint, which is a good thing they do, you kind of have to close your eyes, you'll mainly see this big, long vertical shape and it's more rectangular shape. And then later you can come, once you get these two big things in, you can get these smaller, thinner shapes in later on. You can even go left, see, that's a fuzzy shape. so. If you want to make it sharp, you go up and down, You what we call follow the form, but if you want to keep it softer, which you do in the beginning, you go against the shape, see, kind of against the grain. Big. That's all right, so you just come back and you, you get rid of it, you can shrink it down by just coming in and covering some of it up with the dark. See, see if you can get this kind of uh, curly thing going on here. When you flip it over, some people say it looks like an ear. Looks like an upside down I'm going to do that light. Like yeah, you just kind of, you know, because when you squint, you still see that light shape. So you want to just, you know, indicate it. It doesn't have to be too precise, but we want to get a little image of it in there right now. Just look at the particular. Well, this is too big. It's okay. You can fix it. So you make sure you're not getting too close to the edge, too, because you want to keep things more yeah. centered so that... It doesn't expand. It's, it's still correctable later, but it's better not to make any large mistakes in the beginning because they'll come back to haunt you later. You're doing good, Joe. Never painted before. And I'm going to draw that? Like, kind of just... Yeah, just, you can... See, so you're doing something that I, I instinctively used to do years ago, Joe. I think you're going to be a natural painter. I used to do what I call connect the dots, make some little dots, and then when you're sure the shape is right, then you come back and connect them. So you notice that it, it comes down fairly straight, then it bumps out, then it comes back up there. I think I'm gonna get too far over though. That's right, you can always restate it. You can always, yeah, so you get a little far left. Just come back with the brush, get rid of it, and try it again. So you couldn't do this with acrylic or watercolor because it would sink in and dry right away and it's not as correctable. That's why it's much easier to teach the basics to uh, beginners especially with, with oils because it's much more forgiving. You can also notice, for example, this is much closer to the big shape here. That's farther away. That gives you a little idea too of placement or positioning.
These are too far apart. That's all right. What we're doing in a minute is put some black out and we're going to get some darker tone on the background because even though most brands of Romber are, we put them in the one slot, they're actually closer to a two. So if we want to get that real dark background, we're going to need to add some black to the paint that's already on there. Because you can't get any darker in the, than black. Black is very close to being, it's actually lower in value than one. It's like a 0 0.5 in most brands. I have to go in. There you go, there you go. This is looking good down here though. That was over too far, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of like when you put a shape down, or in this case, pull a shape out, you sort of want to study it for a second. You know, sort of like if you were shooting a gun, aim well and then fire, you know. You'll have less reason to come back and correct it later. Yeah, see, it's good enough for now. Now we can take another brush with black, which is that what we call on the chart here. Do I want to one. finish that? Yeah, you could you could do a little more there. Just need to get that bottom, that top piece here, a little closer to that shape there. Where at what? Because this is this is a little bit closer. That'll give you that that curve going on there. If you get this shape closer to that bigger piece right there. See, most, most of us are not used to thinking abstractly or seeing abstractly, which is what you're doing here. It takes a little practice to get into that thought process. Because ironically, you have to think and paint abstractly to end up with a realistic image at the end. There you go, that's better. Okay, okay now I'm missing this. That's good enough. So, you know, let's take one of these other brushes and I don't think you probably have to use any kind of a, either the solvent or the oil, but let's see what this feels. This feels pretty fluid as it is. So you're going to starting from the outside edges, start to apply this, but then stop when you feel like it's getting lighter than what this is going to look like. So you're going to basically cover all of what most people call the background. It's just a dark surrounding light in our mind. I try to talk and think abstractly, so rather than talking too much about actual things. Like, so just you know, the same way, like yeah. You can, we'll put a little more paint because I think that's not going to cover otherwise. Yeah. And they won't mix? And... No, they will, but it doesn't matter because we're actually trying to darken the first coat. So this black will kind of eat up the first coat of paint and make it appear to be, actually make it darker. Just be careful as you get towards, and so you could, you're already starting to get the shape just by the way you're getting that curve. You'll get, you'll start to get the shape at the bottom of it just by doing that. Okay. But remember that there's really no sharp outside edges in this picture except for this part up here. So what you don't want to fall in the trap of is starting to see edges here that don't exist. See, these are what are called lost or soft edges. The only sharp edges are here, here, and a few places there. Okay. But I think not used to the looking at as an artist, I'm still trying to. It's okay. But see, that's why we put it upside down so that you're not going to fall into that trap as easily. If you did it right side up, I notice when we do portraits, when people haven't done them, you know, very many in their painting career, they get a much better likeness when they do them upside down than when they, if they were to do it right side up because they'd be too focused on painting eyes, ears, and noses and not just painting the shapes of light and dark in certain colors that make up the eyes, ears, and noses. So. Different things, right? Yeah, right. We're working a little bit right side up, but we're not going to work on too long right side up because you'll fall into the trap without realizing it subconsciously. You'll start thinking handle and, you know, like teapot, whatever that's supposed to be, actually. I don't even know. It's one of the students had brought that in one time. I think it's some kind of a pot to boil something in. Keep looking back at the subject because, like I said, five seconds is what most people's memory, visual memory lasts. See, like, for example, you might notice that this is a little bit smaller yet. You can maybe bring that in a little bit more on the left. 
these will get softer. This way, what the darken? Yeah, the darken. So I can cover the white. Yeah, because oh. if the light if the light shape is too big, the only way to shrink is by covering with some dark. Okay. If the light shape is too small, the only way you can make it bigger is by expanding with the rag. So you've got that option. See, the rag is for the lights. The brush is for the darks. Think of it like that. So we'll take a little break once this rub out this monochrome. You know, one color stage of the painting is done, then we'll come back and we'll mix up the actual colors, the, you know, the yellows, the oranges, the little bit of purple in there, even we'll get that made up to uh, do the second stage, which will be the full color. Oh, see, that's that's actually that's an adequate start. This is this basically takes the place of a sketch. And when most people sketch on the canvas with charcoal or whatever before they paint, they don't make a real elaborate finished sketch because they're going to paint over it. It doesn't pay to spend a lot of time doing this. This is kind of like the groundwork, the skeleton of the body, the the uh, framework of the house. That's all it represents. So what we're going to do is look at this and ask yourself, if you had to give one, if you had to pick out, and when I talk about color, I'm talking about those vertical rows, you know, like red's a color, or as it's referred to technically, hue. If you ever heard the term hue, that's what that means, like red's a hue, green's a hue. There's 12 hues in the color wheel. Now we've simplified this down to just the three primaries, you know, which is red, yellow, and blue. The three secondaries, which is orange, green, and purple. And then I included one tertiary, which is a, the double name colors, red, orange, which I also call the flesh tone row. When you do portraits, that's the one row you tend to use more. So I include that in there. We also have two grays here, warm and a cool gray. The cool grays, which for reasons today is much more common in most pictures. Uh, and it does a better job of graying because it's doesn't have that yellowish orange quality that the warm grays have. But these are all these paints are actually either paints from the past or paints in, in the present can be fit in. Any brand of paint you could possibly buy will fit in there somewhere. If you go to you actually went to the store with that chart, you can find a match for any one of those. I also have a, a kind of a color key that I include when people get this to uh you know, tell them it's about the tw maybe the, t the most popular 12 brands of color today. You know, like Windsor Newton, Grumbach are ones that most people are familiar with. Um, and again, this is because it's based on a Monzel system. Like, for example, Red 5 is CAD Red Light. That's a very common color, but that does vary by brand. So some brands, it might fit in at Red 5. Some brands, it might be Red 3. But see, if we look at this, overall, this is a pretty dark subject. So what we're going to do is try to figure out what the couple of dominant colors are. Like if you look at the the chart there, even places where there's no paint laid out, uh, ask yourself, do you think that this is more warm, meaning yellow, red, or orange, or more cool, meaning green, blue, or purple? What do you think the, the dominant color? Yeah, if you squint, red, yeah, so it's more on the warm side. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna dip in more from those. There is a little bit of a cool color, and I don't know if you can detect that, Jill, some a cooler couple of cooler colors in there. Can you see that? Is that the grays? Yeah, the grays are one of that. That, that up there looks almost kind of bluish. If our gray is not cool enough, we can always add some blue to it to, to cool it off even further. But do you see anything in this area that kind of looks like something on the right side of the palette? Right here? Yeah. What do you think? What do I think what? Do you, I don't see Where any green in there or blue, but how about, do you see any purple in there? A little bit of purple? Um, Slight bit. My guess, if I was an artist, I'd say purple. Well, no, right no. Here, you right know here. what? See, here's an interesting thing about painting <laughs> tonally. Even if you don't see it or don't want to put it in, even if you if you got the tones right in whatever color you choose. Now, of course, if you made it green or blue, it wouldn't look like a so-called copper, you know, vessel because I think that actually was copper. Um, but because we identify objects many times by by color, you know, like you say, this apple's a uh, golden delicious because it's basically yellow. This is red, you know, gr Granny Smith is what green, you know. So we use color more or less, but it doesn't have anything to do with the, the, sh the what we call the illusion of three dimensionality. That has to do with light and dark. Jill could have painted this picture with just using the grays and it would still look three dimensional. It would look like a shiny, some kind of metal. We couldn't be able to tell maybe that it was copper without the color added to it. But what makes it look three-dimensional and makes it look metallic is getting the values right. So that's really the most important thing about painting. I always think of, uh, I use the example in class of, you know, if you were to compare this to baking a cake, 
you've got three components of the cake. You've got the batter, you've got the pan, you've got the, um, the, the frosting. Which one is tone, which one's form, which one's color related to painting. You can't have a cake without batter, so that would be tone, light and dark. And then the form is the pan. Form is a pan. So if you happen to have, you know, you can still make a nice cake without any frosting. So color is just like the frosting added on. It, it's, it's not dependent on getting color in there to make it look 3D. It's a nice addition, but we worry less about that. We focus more on getting the tones right and the resulting forms. And then if that's correct, then you can, that's why we're, now we're going to come into the color aspect of it. Okay. So we've only got one purple out of the two. We can mix up more if we need to. We basically, you can mix purple by mixing the dark red and the dark blue, which you can do that right now in fact. Take some of this over here and some of that. I'll let you mix that up. So you put a little together until you feel like it looks kind of like what you think of a purple looking like. Things are not always half So I half. just grab a little bit yeah, of each? Yeah, a little bit of each, right? What do you do? Just kind of do it like yeah, like that. See, if you do it like this, keep it on the, keep it like this. It's more of a, it see, it still green. looks blue, so you can add more of the, uh, of the red to it. Because that's all purple is, is a combination. But see, this is really foolproof. When you follow the simple rules of the system, only mix left to right, which is changing the hue and the intensity, and don't try to make more values by mixing up and down. You almost can't make a mistake. Do that as we go along. But that's basically the colors you need, the five mixtures, to paint this in color. Okay? These? Yep. That, that row of... We've now, we're going to call those altered oranges. They're muted or grayed down oranges, which is basically a lot of what's in there. But there will be other colors. By the end, we might put a little bit of red in there. There might be a little bit of purple just to finish it off. Okay. So we got, we're doing a little more like ready, aim, fire, you know. More thinking as, as my old uh, teacher says, you know, think more and you'll paint less and you'll paint better. There's even a, some sayings that the Aussies that uh, the, the first guy came up with this, uh, he was from Melbourne, he said, keep it as soft as you can, as neutral as you can for as long as you can, meaning keep the edges soft, keep it neutral, meaning on the gray side, you can always intensify it as long as you can and you'll do a better painting. This is why it really pays to have at least a couple dozen brushes on hand at all times. Because, you know, dirty brushes at the end of the day means you end up with a clean canvas. If you got a very few dirty you know, a lot of clean brushes, you're going to have with a dirty canvas. So it's kind of like a, it works against you if you try and, like, I, I don't mind washing brushes because that means I have a clean canvas as a result. But you want to try and keep, you want to think of this almost like puzzle pieces or, as somebody pointed out one time, a mosaic. A mosaic is made up of colored pieces of glass or stone that are fit one next to the other. And you want to keep them as separate as you can. You can blend them at the end but keep them separate for now. Do you want to be able to say that's a seven, that's a five, that's a three, okay? Now as a non-painter, what do you think of this? Does this chart, the way it's set up, make sense to you? By the numbers and by the, the color names? Well, yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, yeah, because then without this, what what did you used to do? I mean, how? That's, that's the problem everybody else has got. Know, they, know. That's the problem. It takes years of doing it haphazardly and trying to remember what you mix to get what, you know. And the system's been around a long time with the numbers and the hues, but what's unique about what I did here was integrated with all the brands of paint on the market. That's what's a little different. You can make something that looks like black. Some people have sort of a fear of using black. It's been told them by teachers, like, don't use black because of the French Impressionist. But if you mix the three primaries, red one, yellow one, and blue one, you'll get black. They cancel each other out. So if you throw a little bit of your yellow one in there, actually maybe you grab the one to the left of it, that orange one might cover a little bit better. That ought to make it look less bluish. Because see the blue kind of overtook the mixture. We want to get rid of some blue. You can put a little more red in there too. That ought to straight. Yeah, start from the outside. And then just be real careful because, see, you can also correct the shapes. If you think a light shape is too big, you can cut into it slightly with the dark now. If you're careful, just be real careful about you know, If you make a mistake and go over the dark that you don't want it, a light area you didn't want to, you could always wipe it back. But if you take it nice and slow and easy, you make very few mistakes. 
This is where we're at so far. Yeah. Starting to definitely look like a solid object. Right. See, the beginning, you can, here's how, this is kind of procedure. In the beginning, it's rough, so you go like this. Yeah. And you said, by the end, you're going like this, Joe. Individual strokes, very controlled, very precise. You know? So it gets more precise as you There you go. go, there you go. Remember, start like a butcher and like a surgeon. That's a great <laughs> thing to remember. Okay, that's really starting to create definite illusion of that thing already. The tones are starting to come together. A little color, but we're not all there yet. But you can see already what makes the thing look 3D is not the color, it's the contrast of light and dark. Something like this, if you're doing product design, it would be perfect, but this is a painting. It's meant to be viewed. It's, you know, it's fine art means done for its own sake, you know, so we're not going to be too precise. And we're trying to be as precise as we can with the mixtures and the placement of the tones. But uh, part of the, the looseness, as we call it, in painting, in tonal painting, especially part of the charm of the painting is that you, it's not a photographic rendering. It's, it's somebody that's done it by hand and, you know, the, uh, there's a little margin of error there. You know. Okay. Which is why I made the background of that chart gray, to make mm. it look like it's in the middle, it's neutral. If you tried to mix these colors on a white surface, it would throw you because it would make everything look much darker by contrast. So that's why you don't want to really use a white palette when you paint tonally. So you notice also that each one of these color rolls has its strongest value at a different number. Like the strongest red is red 5, whereas the strongest orange is orange 7. The strongest purple is probably that purple three. So you get used to that too the more you paint to know which ones are are strong or which ones you got to be more careful with, not to add too much or too little of. It is a bit more blue than the other ones. The color is relative. Tone is not so much. I mean, three is a three, five is a five. But color, you know, two people might see each color slightly differently. But um, and the nice thing about color is that once you take the subject away. Once the models go home, as, as we used to say, once the model's gone home, nobody's gonna know what color they were. Right. So whether it's gonna be correct or not is dependent on the value, not the color. But also, in terms of color, all you have to worry about is not making it too intense. You know, cool meaning it's got blue in it. That tells you it's cool. Oh, okay. Think if, think, see, when I think warm and cool, I remember a teacher, Daniel Green, told me years ago, said, what's the warmest thing in the universe? Sun. The sun. What color do we think of when you think of the sun? Yellow. Okay, what's what's cool? Water. There you go. Okay. That's a good way to remember it, right? Okay. All right. And that's all you need to know about color. Warm and cold, and what the basics are. Color theory doesn't really help you paint better. We want practical color knowledge, which is what this chart teaches you. Okay. Hold that up and see if that occurs anywhere. See any part, like mm. the body of it maybe? If it looks too orangey. It looks too red. Okay, then we still got to cool it off. Add more of that blue to it. We could put more blue on too. I think we need more of it. It's kind of a weak blue. That's the blue spot. That's one of those colors that's going way up in price. It's too paint now about fifty dollars. Wow. What do they make paint from? All kinds of things. Either, believe it or not. Animal, vegetable, and mineral. Oh. The black there, the reason they call it ivory black, it used to be made from burnt the scraps when they do ivory carvings. Mm -hmm. They burn them and they turn black. Now they use uh, just, they burn bones to make ivory black. Oh. So that's an animal product. How's that? That's better. See that? Because see, people refer to painting wet on wet. We try to paint wet next to wet. If you're painting wet on wet, you're probably going to get colors you don't want by mistake. It's purple, it's going to create gray, which in this case we don't want. See how the mosaic idea comes about? It's just one piece of paint next to another, one patch, one, one tile of color. You can think of it all different ways, but you try to keep them as separate as you can. So eventually we'll get a lot more of that. There's a lot more of that purplish color on there than you might have originally thought. Because mm -hmm. you know? I mean, most people part? wouldn't even maybe say that was a copper pot. What, what happened was there was some things around it that were purplish and that got reflected into the pot. Right. You don't have to know that to paint it, but sometimes it's... Do I need a new brush? Yeah, if you're going to switch this, there you go. Always new one. Because we're... See, only when you run out of brushes totally do you wash them out to get a fresh Yeah, because we're out. 
No, you still got tons of them there. Oh, but those are big. Well, that's okay. I don't like that. All right, where am I going? Most now? newcomers don't. What? <laughs> most new, most new painters don't like the big ones. No. So okay. you gotta you gotta force yourself to think reverse what you would normally think. Okay. More look, less put. That's how the Aussies put it. More look, less do more thinking, more visualizing, and less painting, and do a better job. See, now is where you gotta be careful not to mix up the brushes because it's really easy to put a five brush into the one pile or you know something else you want to keep them separate keep your keep an eye on which ones if you're not sure you can always put a little dab of it next to the pile of paint to check to see if it's the right value value you could equate that with number that's how you can remember what that means the number is the value so you can think about it probably at least 80 percent of this canvas is going to be darker rather than the light that's why it reads as being metallic because mm. of that big contrast you see if it was a less reflective object it'd be a lot more light in there but again you don't need to know that to paint it if you just follow what you see you'll get the illusion automatically that's what's different about this method this way of thinking than other ways of approaching painting or other ways of teaching painting is that you don't have to know anatomy you don't have to know perspective Composition. I mean, these are all things that come about naturally by just, you know, observing the tones and the colors and putting the pieces of paint that you mix correctly in the right place. That's really, I mean, it sounds simple. Obviously, it's, it takes a lot of practice to get to be an expert at it, but it, it is that simple in theory. You know. All right, so what do you think? So you keep looking around now, Jill. This is where you really want to be a little... Critical. Pretend it's somebody else's picture you're looking at and you're looking for mistakes. See, when you squint, here's where the black mirror is going to come in handy. This black mirror is just a piece of plexiglass that's been coated on one side with black acrylic. When you flip it around, you see a darkened version of what, what looks like white in reality will look like a five value here. And what it does, it exaggerates the differences between your canvas and the subject. So you'll the mistakes will jump out where it looks a little bit lighter in reality it'll look a lot lighter in here so it just exaggerates and amplifies the mistakes so hold it like this put it up by your nose and look at the tumor first and you'll be able to see where you're too light it'll jump out where you're not light enough it'll sink away okay and you got maybe a little bit of both you can look for you see any place where you can go a little bit lighter or where it doesn't look like it's jumping out strongly this enough? needs to be smoothed out okay yeah but how about one area that's not maybe standing out enough where there's more contrast in the photo but not as much in yours? There's one place I'm looking at in particular. Up here needs to be. Yep. But see, even this, <coughs> see, when I when you look through the mirror, this is more defined. This can give right. you a little bit lighter, and then you need a sharper edge over here. You need to go with some of the darker stuff here because that's a pretty, because again, here, just like here, hard edge on this side, this part, the hard edge is on that side, and it gradually softens on the right. See, now I think we can flip it over and maybe finish it right side up because I think we're not going to fall in the trap at this point of looking at it as a pot and getting hung up on that. The big stuff's already been established, so. This is crooked. That's what I've been trying to get. Now look through your phone. You've mentioned before what it looked like through your phone. because it gets shrunk down, which makes it appear to be quite a distance away. How's it look there? You see any Mine's differences? Mine's skinnier, yeah. Okay, so you look for the differences there. See, for example, you were mentioned before that uh, it, it was a little too, I think I forget the word used, but you could see that this was a little too abrupt over here. Yeah. This has got to be, see, you can even go like this. Sometimes that does it. Oh. Just with your finger. But see, when I squint down, which gives me a preview of what it looks like later on, it's starting to look very realistic already. So you got to be careful to hang on to what's good before you correct what's not so good. That's the tricky part. Now you got to be real careful, be real deliberate in what you put down and put it in exactly the right places you can. See, now you start to notice more subtleties because 
you went from having no experience oh maybe that a couple hours ago now you've got some experience to draw on. no pun intended mm -hmm. to draw on. <laughs> to paint on back mirror again just to see where if you're too light remember it's going to pop on you or if an edge is too sharp it'll jump on you too you might want to get a little farther away you might get both of them in view pretty comfortably perfect <laughs> Well, you see, the thing is, at this stage, the differences are getting smaller and smaller. This is why, you know, tell everybody, don't look for mistakes, you know, because you'll find them if you keep looking. Um, if you look at your neighbor's painting, you'll find more. But, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> as I say, if you want to really find your mistakes, let the guy next to you tell you what the mistakes are. <laughs> That's assuming he's a good friend. He's not going to rip your painting. But um, study it. You know, the only thing you never want to do this is pick up a brush and start painting without looking at the subject first. Always look, check the subject first to make sure that, because many times I thought I'm going to fix something, I look again, I thought, you know what, it looks okay. I didn't need to fix it. So, see, now is where we want to be adding color. We can, we've got the luxury of adding more color because we've dealt with the tones and the shapes pretty well. We've made the cake. It's been baked, you know, so to speak, from before. Now we can start adding the frosting, right? Yeah. Frosting also, the detail is part of that, that last stage too, you know. Any tiny little, uh, if there were some rivets on there, you put that into the end too, you know. But now if that thing was scratched or something, that's kind of thing you leave out, you know. Mm. Um, I had one stuff I did, it had a nice dent in it, but I did want to put that in because it kind of added something to it, you know. But normally you just ignore it. If it goes away when you squint, leave it out. That's the rule of thumb. If it disappears once when you squint. What were you saying? Before? Um to fix this. Okay, now what do you think's wrong there? Shape or tone? Um I think the tone. Okay. Lighter or darker? I think it needs to be lighter. Okay. Well, what color do you want to use for that? Something lighter. No, but which color? I mean, purple, blue. Which blue. did we use? Well, I think you could see that maybe if you look. Well, I don't think it's so blue, is it? You talking about right here when you said that? No, right here. First of all, they're going like that. This brush is a little stiff from last time. See, good that softens yeah. up the edge. Uh, okay. But then I see I can see it's a little more blue in there. It looks a little too gray right now. Can you see that? You could put maybe a little bit of this one in there. Just, not too much, because that stuff goes a long way. Really? But just try it out, see what it looks like, see if it improves it. If it doesn't, we can always take it out. How's that look? Gives you more of a sensation of blueness. Yeah, that's definitely looking better. It's cooler. Cooling it off. See, then to soften it further, you could take a, a different brush. Let me see if we got a brush that's got some five on it. Otherwise, we still got brushes left. Thank goodness, right? See, so again, this and this will make that. So you can go like this, then, and this will further soften it and maintain that coolness. Wow. You see that? Yeah. That's probably the coolest part of the whole painting. You know, in terms of being bluer than anywhere else. A little bit of that may be up in the handle too, if you want to throw a few dabs up in this area. Can you see it? Just a little bit of blueness up there that you're missing. Okay. See, so step back. See, the thing to do is do a little bit and then stop because the danger now is to overdo it if you don't watch it. That's where stepping back will. And we'll get, we'll get that even defined more by putting some highlights at the brain. Now, is there any place else you can see that color occurring any place else? I think right here. This is exactly where I was looking. Be very careful because that. See, the final thing to get that to really pop will be to go lighter yet. Maybe add a little bit of white to that oh, lighter. to make it really jump. Yeah. Then we'll have to add those dark spots. Yeah. Well, see, the little stuff, if you're talking about those little breaks that are darker in between, 
yeah. that I ignore. What I would do later on is come back with the dark, really dark, dark, to define the edge more. Oh. See if you come back and hit that one more time, that'll pop that edge right out. That's pretty darn good. See, so, you know, if you feel that thing's a little bit, to use an old term, if it looks a little out of round, then you can come in with the dark, dark again. See, for example, it's maybe a little too bumpy down mm -hmm. here. You can come back and cut it in with this, you know. Just be real careful, like I said, when you're changing shape now because the alternations, the alterations are very slight. They're not going to be big, you know. You don't want to take too much off or, you know, add too much. But that's okay. See, now is the appropriate time to do that. Way in the beginning, it wouldn't have been. So everything has to be done in proper order, you know. Big to, here's the rule of thumb. Big to small, dark to light, dull to bright. That made up that little rhyme. Mm. That's, that's a procedure. You start with the big stuff first, then the small. Now you put the small. You start with the dark, then you went to the light. And then you started duller, meaning more gray, and now you're going more intense. If you keep that in mind, you're going to make a lot big difference. <laughs> Yeah, see if you can increase the shape of that, the size of that highlight a little bit, and have it just fuse together a little more gradually with the rest of it. With white? Yeah. Now, if you ran out of brushes, although you still got... Like right here. Yeah, you see it? Clean? If you squint, you see on top of one. Yeah. Because where it's too light, when you squint, it'll jump. If it's too dark, which is less likely to happen, it'll go away. That's the All tip right, of then I just... Put it the background Which color? value do you need? What number? So you think the number first, then the color. Well, it's the background color, right? Right. Which is what number? One. There you go. Thanks to my handy dandy chart here. Yay, nay. I've had people take the workshop just to get that chart. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. Where else can we go? Again, uh, I would look at that black mirror more, more and more as we get towards the end, because you'll see the fine distinctions easier that way. There's some smaller well, light areas, you know. Let's deeper fix yet. this handle. Okay. What do you What do you think's wrong with it? <laughs> Remember, help. there's three things that could be wrong: the tone, light or dark, the shape, or the configuration. Another word for it. Or the color, which one is it? Or which two is it, let's say? Well, I guess the color and the tone. Not the color, because see, you've got that bluish gray going on. We could add a little more blue if you we want. We need highlights for sure. There you go, that's tone. Tone, right. okay. What do I do? Well, what value do you think you need to get that lightest part of it? This the is top. too testy. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> This involves some actual thinking. She Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try the nine. If the nine won't do, you could add a little white, make a nine and a half, you know. We often do that at the end. We have to make No, this little... isn't doing it. Okay, then you gotta add a little white. Actually, you know what I would do here? Look at How about going over here? Blue nine. Try that. I might do it right there. If not, add white to that. You know? And remember to put these lighter touches on at the end, put them on fairly thickly. Don't be skimpy with oh. the paint, they won't cover otherwise. She remembers almost everything I've told her. She won't make the same mistake twice. Wow. Okay, so the blue. Blue and I, right. You notice where it stops being light and it becomes dark. Don't have to get it all off because we're we're not changing the value. We're just making the color a little bit stronger. Which you know? one was it? This one here. We're we're changing the hue there, not the value. There's the difference. We're we're going from kind of greenish blue to more of a blue purple. It didn't matter in the beginning, but now all those things matter. You know. If you see that color somewhere else, put it in. You don't have to overdo it. Is that, did that do anything? Yeah, that made a difference. Let's take and mix up a pretty good batch of the background. We could do that just going like this. We could take all these leftover ones and mix them together. Except for the green. That's too, too green. Put that 
this one, that's it. See now by adding a little bit of oil, which we haven't used really. Is that oil? Is it? Yeah, that's oil. So I'll make sure. We didn't really use that. So you'll see how much more depth this will have by putting that on there. Just get as, you know, it's not like painting a wall. We're not going to get total coverage because it's a one day painting. But it'll look a little bit darker just by putting a final coat on there. Keep it slow. Don't, don't go into somewhere else by mistake. And put it on however you want, but brush it, finish it by going downwards. Now, when you varnish this, it'll look even better. You gotta wait about a month to varnish it. Oh. It'll why? pop out even more. Well, because it'll make the whole picture hang together better. Some parts are gonna sink in when they dry, they're gonna look duller. Other parts will look, uh, usually the darks look shinier and the, the lights look duller. When you varnish it, the whole thing has the same sheen to it. It'll look kind of like, um, like a semi-gloss varnish you see on furniture or on you know wood. See, right now it, it has a lot of gloss because it's wet. Mm -hmm. You'll see it'll suck the, the candles will suck it in after a while. Yeah, be careful around those edges. Right? All right. Let's look one more time in your your camera. Or we can get back here, but I think the camera you're actually looking at closer, about 25 feet away. <laughs> but see, that's that's that doesn't indicate anything bad. That's just part of the method. We're not trying to press people up close. You know, it's meant to be viewed from a distance. You can look up some of these guys online. I can tell you the names. You see their work. It looks almost like undone, unfinished up close, but then when you get back, boom, yeah. what a difference, you know? See, a few places you can just go with your finger, even like, for example, over here, this is kind of sticking out, you just kind of go like this a little bit. Uh, see, over here, this could be a little bit lighter. I think if you take some of that original, where was that one mixture we made here? Or that, that yellow, yeah, where did that go? Looking for the brush here. Oh, we might have washed it. Oh, let me see, this might do. See, as long as it's the same value, like see for example over here. See, if you go a little background? bit lighter here, this won't look quite so jumpy over there. See that? Oops. Yeah, I think the background looks fine. Okay. What do you think? I think I did pretty good. <laughs> Three freaking hours, are you kidding me? <laughs> what time did we start? About 10? Be left after 10? Does it make you want to buy it, Tom? <laughs> it's already hanging in my walls. <laughs> 50 years from now, they'll all be fighting over it, Joe. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, it does look more finished back here. That's the point. See, I, mean, I think, you know, these guys, people will see this that know something about this approach, you know. This is a loose painting versus a tight painting. Guys want to make it look like a photograph. They'd work on it another 20 hours and it looked right. just like the photo, but so what? There's no glory in that, you know. So how do you... To be able to do something nice and simple like this. Well, um, once again, this proves that this method of no drawing, just learning to paint by seeing shapes of light and dark and by using a, a set palette that's, that's configured with value and hue and not just put out in sort of a any order will go, produces good results, even the first time out with no experience.